Mic check, one, two, one, two. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar-chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. Sells. All right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. This is Bob Bender. You're listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. In the studio with us today, Judy Rodman. Judy, welcome to the show. Hey there, Bob. It's great to be on. Well, thank you. You know, I've tracked your career over the years. You've worked with some of the artists that I've worked with. We uh, have been in parallel paths, have we not? Yeah, we have. <laughs> uh, two ships passing in the night. Yeah. yeah. And we were talking about a couple of those that we worked with. Uh, you know, one of them, a female artist who, you know, I got in the beginning of her career, Leanne Rhymes, and and then uh, Brian White, who absolutely love and adore, mm-hmm. just two great artists. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you, we were talking about something before the show started, and I loved what you said, that the, the voice and the mind. Mm-hmm. They're really kind of connected to oh, yeah. each other. Oh, yeah. Listen, the voice is connected to your big toe. If your big toe hurts, it's going to be, you don't want to do master vocal that day because you're distracted. These two little things, I call them little divas. These little, even if you're a guy, they're your little divas. Your vocal cords? <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, you, you have to sacrifice everything else to them <laughs> when you're using them at their best uh, because they require all of your mental capacity like an athlete and they require uh, all your physical energy um, and your uh, you have to be psychologically focused on point to what you're doing with your voice and who you're doing it to and all that yeah it's it's it's, it's a fascinating than, subject it's more than just singing oh yeah people that have a good voice can really have a great voice people that have really no singing talent can they be, yes. Can they be good at least? <laughs> I've trained at least one star that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to ask. The it. only thing, the only thing uh, that that's required is how bad do you want it? Yeah. I exactly. mean, does that not go with the music business right. as well? And we've talked about this in other shows. It's you know, it is a very passionate thing. So how much passion do you have? How much time are you willing to take? To yeah. Get in there? Is your heart in it? Because if it's not, it's not worth it. Right. Yeah. Right. And if you. Uh, sometimes I tell people, you know, you should you should just not be in the business of the arts. You know, go ahead and do it as a hobby or something like that. But the only reason you even want to do it as a hobby is you you can't not and be happy. Right. It it fills a certain spot. You know, even with people in other professions, they do their prof- their other professions better. Lawyers, doctors. I've got plenty of you know experts in other fields who desperately need to take vocal lessons because they desperately need to sing to stay sane and and keep uh, being able to creatively ply their craft in their in their day job. So, yeah. That that's an interesting question there. Let me ask you this cuz uh, I catch myself getting hoarse on occasions mm-hmm. from talking. You can actually talk too much. Not if you know how. See, that's good to know. That's right. I, yeah. I love training speakers and I work with lots of professional speakers in all kinds of, you know, categories, uh, who, uh, most of whom experience vocal fatigue, either that or, uh, or, and, or they also experience a lack of effectiveness with their speaking voices. And those two things actually go together. So let's back up a minute. Okay. (laughs) First of all, how did you get started in all this? Well, I've been singing and speaking since, you know, I was a child and all that. But um, I've been in the music business myself. Uh, for as a professional vocalist and in singing and speaking, mostly singing and songwriting. Uh, oh yeah, and songwriting. Yeah. But I've I've been doing it for about fifty years now. Yeah. I started when I was seventeen, so you can you know add that up. You know, as the streams of income go with the music business, um, mine sort of changed horses in you know different ways, def- several different times. In fact, when 
you know, at first the jingle mill, the jingle uh, career was, that was just, that was my day job in Memphis. And then the jingles kind of dried up and uh, background singing, you know, I was here in Nashville in the 80s when everybody needed background singers right. and I was part of those groups that did that. And that was my number one job. I could not, you know, 10, two sixes and tens. And uh, then that kind of dried up. I haven't heard that expression up. in a while. I know, yeah, it's yeah. been a while. And then uh, that dried up a little bit, and I started, well, actually I started songwriting because I was bored. You know, I just like, I liked singing, and, and I was in a cover band in Memphis, and I got I got bored because they weren't writing the stuff that I actually wanted to say. So in writing, you know, I finally met Tommy West, and long story short, I became an artist. And then the label MTM, you know, folded, and that stopped. Well, I kept on songwriting, and with Warner Chapel, I had a number one there. And then that dried up, and then it's like, okay, what can I do? And then Carol Chase, my dear friend, who I'd been singing and writing with for a long time. You may know her, but if for the audience, she she is actually on the road now, I think she still is, with Leonard Skinner and has been for a long time. And she was having a little trouble hitting a high note. So she asked me one day, she said, Judy, can you help me do this? And I'm like, okay, how do you, but you how, why do you think I know? Then, right? No, yeah, yeah. but she knew that I sort of knew how, because I'd been doing, you know, I'd been uh, working with groups and, and arranging and, and directing groups for a long time, and, and she'd been a lot of the, in a lot of those groups. And so she planted the bug in my head, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll be a vocal coach. So I didn't have the academia, but I had the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I had, there was something that enabled me to diagnose stuff really early, and I could feel it, because I'd had vocal damage in Memphis from an endotracheal tube, lost an octave and a half of my range. So long story short, I'd finally developed my own professional uh, method of teaching that was not based in academia, but was based on experience and science. And I, you know, talked to doctors and and uh, chiropractors and Alexander practitioners and studied other people's methods and but all to figure out for myself what works, what will make me valuable. And here is in a business sense, what will make me valuable to anybody that comes into me, especially, you know, somebody whose voice is important to them. And little by little, I figured out that my ideal client is the professional voice, not the academic voice, even though I do work with lots of college kids and stuff. But my forte is the professional speaker and the professional singer. Got a lot of ninja tricks that I've learned through I the like years. I like that, a lot of ninja yeah. tricks. That's good. Yeah. Songwriters that, let me rephrase that, artists or musicians that come to town. And it doesn't have to be Nashville. It can be Los Angeles. I noticed on your bio, you... You can actually, you know, I, I, we do so much now over the phone or Skype, you know, it's, it doesn't always have to be in person, but right. so many artists that come to town, songwriters, singers, do you find a certain amount that have already got vocal damage before they even really get started in their career? Uh, they have, or is it abuse? It, it's or almost, it's almost universal that they have experienced vocal strain. And they may not have progressed to the damaged place yet. So I was going to ask They're heading you, that way. So you, it, it, so vocal strain in, in some aspects is like tinnitus. You can get the ear ringing, but if you don't continue to be around loud volumes, you know it won't do permanent yes, damage. Yes, right, right. Yeah. And and here's something else that most people don't know, and this is I believe this with all my heart. Vocal damage, unless it's from organic disease, is never necessary. I don't care how long you work if you know how to uh, protect your voice and you have really good technique, you never have to experience. You know, when I was on the road as an artist, I remember I didn't want to do a radio uh, interview before the show because I could tell a little bit of difference in my vocal stamina when I started singing, you know, because mm -hmm. my songs were kind of rangy. And uh, so I tried to get them to book the interviews afterwards. Now I know why. And now I work with people that do the do that you know, all, all the time, uh, you know, voiceover artist in New York, we worked by Scott, by a, a webcam and, uh, she was experiencing vocal fatigue, you know, people that are, uh, uh, done book, book tours or business people or ministers or professors or, uh, you know, just business people and definitely artists. Usually, 
In fact, I would say the speaking voice can get the artist in more trouble than their singing voice. Really? Yeah. Why is that? Because they don't support their speaking voice. They, 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 even if they do know a little bit of technique and how to support and control their singing voice, when it's time to talk, you know, they're going to bend over or it, if they're nice people. And, it, and it's posture and, yeah. and, and, and they'll even shrink. I, my tall artists have a terrible habit of trying to shrink down to the fan's size, you know, and, and be nice to them. And, and, and that's just smooch to mort as far as the voice is concerned. <laughs> It's what? <laughs> it's French for kiss of death. Oh, kiss of death. Okay. <laughs> Not really, but I think it is. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we definitely have more to talk about here. Judy Rodman's in the studio with us today. Vocal coach uh, has worked with quite a few of the artists that uh, I, I have worked with over the years, which is kind of a nice memory lane, yeah. you know, going down memory yeah. lane. But, uh, you know, you're the vocal coach in residence. Um, I guess you have actually, let me say, you've been named best vocal coach by uh, Nashville Music Pros and, and Vocal Coach in Residence uh, by the, the Voice Council magazine. So we definitely have a lot to talk about, especially your vocal training method, Power, Path, and Performance. Yes. This is Bob Ender, and you're listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Larry Butler, and I'm the author of the Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, and I'm here on the air on The Business Side of Music with Bob Bender, and uh, enjoy yourself. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Vinny Rebus, the founder of Vindy Connect. Our goal is to ensure that you have the knowledge, the tools, skills, resources, and connections that you need to develop a profitable and long-lasting career in music. One way we do this is through these Business Side of Music podcasts. I'd also like to invite you to check out Indie Connect magazine, our free multimedia online publication packed with practical interviews and advice from music industry experts. Go to www.indieconnectmag. That's www.indieconnectmag.com. Let us walk with you and guide you every step of your musical journey. You're listening to the business side of music. This is Bob Bender. You're listening to this edition of the Business Side of Music. In the studio today, Judy Rodman, vocal coach. Uh, should also say recording artist, stage and television performer, public speaker, author, songwriter, musician, studio producer, <laughs> and vocal consultant. You have actually created a vocal training course called Power Path in Performance. Yes, and I just you, I just called it that because of the alliteration of the P's. Yeah. But what a... How I did it was when I first started teaching some 20-something years ago, gradually I realized that everything I know about the voice that's important to a, sing a singer or a speaker, I can fit in one of these three areas, mm -hmm. and that is breath. You've got to understand that, and uh, that's uh, the balance of breath uh, support and breath control so that you got to support your voice, but at the same time, you have to control that breath because breath is the voice's enemy, an absolute enemy. It's like atomic power. I never thought about it's that. It's like atomic power. A little bit, can, you know, just, just enough can power your grid. Too much, you blow the place up. Right. So breath has got to be managed, and you do have to send it up. Otherwise, you got no grid, you know. For, yeah, exactly. Just keep with the analogy. Yeah. But you got to know how to do that. And where I found that uh, you want to sense that you come from is not the diaphragm. It's your pelvic floor. In other words, sing your butt off so you don't sing your throat out. That's <laughs> it's a, a good, good way to analogy, remember yeah. <laughs> and then the second area is the throat. And if your throat is not open, then your vocal cords are going to suffer and your vibration from your larynx is not going to be able to reach your resonation zones. So if you want to sound like a munchkin, you can thin it out. <laughs> you know, with voiceover artists, they have to change the voice cave to fit different characters. But for most people and artists, you want to keep that sucker open no matter what you're singing or saying. Is that where most of the damage comes yes. from? Yes. Uh, well, that plus the air pressure. You know, it, you send too much air pressure, even if it's a little too much air pressure, through a stricture, you know, like a tightness right. about in the post-nasal drip zone. And you do that night after night, uh, or you talk that way all day at your uh, serving gig, and then you go try to do your demo or your master, and you're wondering what in the world happened to your voice. You know, right. 
it's it's the combination of breath and tight throat that really is the you know the uh, fetic complete as far as vocal strain and that leads to damage but then there's another area and without this third area it's useless no matter how good your breath is or how open your throat is and that I call performance. But what I mean by that is communication. And I'm going to share a little secret. Okay. That almost zero people We won't tell anybody. Have got, yeah, really. Except can for those can we keep listening. it between yeah. ourselves? Yeah. Okay. This thing only exists for one reason. Most, and I'm pointing to my neck here. Most people think it exists to get a, you know, a Grammy or applause, you know, or be judged, uh, be judged where the chairs turn around on the voice and all that. Right. No. It doesn't exist for that. It only exists to deliver messages. And that's huge because if you're just singing to be good or when, you know, win applause or Grammys, your voice is going to be like a flashlight beam, you know, or like telling your inner horse, which is what I like to call the automatic nervous system, to go left, right, you know, back and forward, up and down at the same time. It's like, blah. And you experience either numbness or a lack of, a lack of, uh, a passion or inauthentic passion right. or something, you know, right. because the voice doesn't know what it's doing. Okay. It, it so has to be directed. It has to be. It's got to be directed and yeah. always, always to one heart, even if it's the heart of the stadium that you're singing the Star Spangled Banner to. So you've got to know who you're talking to. And it's very much like acting technique. And then you'll get just like actors, you know, they're not talking to the audience, but they can make you stop eating your popcorn if they're doing their job. So when we're as artists, when, when you're singing, you got to know to whom you are talking. Could be somebody that doesn't exist. Almost always is somebody that's not there. And in the studio, that's a big deal. Deal. Most people sing to the pop filter or the producer, and really? Right, <laughs> right. And then if you do it well enough, you get a response. And that response is nonverbal. So anyway, you know, when you, you uh, take all the feelers of a really creative person and you direct them towards that one heart and the response that they want from that one heart, all of a sudden you got stage presence and you got some magic in your studio vocal and people can't like not look. Wow. So put that all together That's and it's mouthful. synergistic. Yeah. Yeah. So if you put breath, throat, and communication techniques together... Mm -hmm they all affect each other. And so when somebody comes into me, I'm going to look for that, okay, where is the issue? Where's the worst part of this equation? Let me fit, let's, let's get in there and tweak that. And then everything else starts to come online. Because it may just be one thing. Yeah. Well, it, it, if it's one thing, it's something else too. But that one thing may fix that something else. Got you. So it's really fun because it's fast. You know, the, uh, the improvement and the protection. It's really fast. And you have some other courses, uh, singing in the studio and the vocal production right. workshop. Right. Singing, let me ask you this. Singing in the studio, is it different than singing live on stage? Or Absolutely. should it be the same? Okay. Absolutely. In fact, one of the first questions I'll ask somebody is, where do you think you sing better? On stage or in the studio? You know, where they sing the best? where they've been doing it the most because they're the most familiar with that sure. and they can focus their feelers right. It's okay? a comfort zone for them. Right. Yeah. Uh, but in the studio and with instrumentalists, I mean, you got issues with what their hands are doing that's messing their breath up or not. It, you know, so you say what they're doing with their hands. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, big time. If, you're, if your hands, and when I work with musical theater people, if your hands are in front of you, this is like, please like me. If your elbows are behind me, it's like saying, you know, you want me, <laughs> come to me. And yeah. you're the magnet and your breath, your rib cage is open. So your breath is, is right. And your head is back. So your throat is more open. And all of a sudden you can deliver your messages more confidently and authentically because it feels great. Mm -hmm. So posture and, and all that, you know, it's, it's, it all goes into it. At the studio, you have to know how to stand in a mic. And so... It's not just getting up to the uh -uh. microphone. Inevitably, the music stands right in front of you, right? Yeah. Or And the cue box is too. You got to move those suckers if you possibly, you know, unless you're with a group and you can't, not supposed to do that. But move them and walk in with your feet and then your head is automatically back. Otherwise, you'll hit the pop filter with your mouth. 
or your nose. So all of a sudden, you've got your rib cage is more open, so you've got more control over your voice, and things start going better. But if you don't know these little ninja tricks of, see, in the studio, you're generally not holding a mic. So your hands become rib anchors, and that messes your breath up, to, and your head kind of goes forward, and that messes your throat up. So I give my guitar players and my pianists that you know uh, play a lot when they're singing on stage, I'll give them a back scratcher in between their hands, and all of a sudden, I, I had this, the first time I ever noticed this, this effect, I was singing backgrounds in one of those simul sessions back years ago for Johnny Cash. And Snake Reynolds was the engineer. Right, remember? yeah. And he was up there, and he, I, I saw him send the second engineer down for the audience that doesn't know simul mm -hmm. sessions are where everybody does it together, including the artist and the background singers and the band. Old school way of doing yeah. it. Yeah. So I, I noticed they brought uh, the second engineer brought Johnny's uh, guitar down to him with no strings. And I was thinking to myself, hmm, I wonder why they're doing that. Now I know. And it was a comfort factor, sure, to him. He's familiar with it. But the reason was, when they put the guitar, the guitar in his arms, his rib cage opened up. And so he had more control of his voice. And I'm sure absolutely nobody in that room knew why. But they just noticed it worked better. Do you think it's best for someone in the studio to be standing or sitting on a stool? or If you know how to sit on a stool, and this goes for writer's nights, too or the moment in this the concert. This is good for our listeners if right. you're a songwriter, right. right, on a writer's night. Exactly. Uh, or your artist uh, that wants to s spend a moment on the stool, you know, and s sing a particular song and change it up a little. Put one foot all the way down on the ground, and it's like you're standing. If you the boom stand is close enough into you, so that you're not leaning forwards into it. Wow. And so, oh yeah, those little ninja tricks. That's a good little, yeah, that's a nice tip. We're going to take another break and we come back. We've got more to talk about here in the studio with award-winning vocal coach, recording artist, uh, stage and television performer, Judy Rodman. You're listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Jeff Werick, tour manager for Eddie Money, and you're listening to The Business Side of Music. Listening to the business side of music. Wow, I just joined the Music Starts Here community. This is a truly hidden gem for anyone in the music business. Whether you live in Nashville or anywhere else in the world, Music Starts Here is like a GPS for your music career. This is the place to be if you want to get advice and direction from some seriously talented musical people who have been where you want to go. Music news, events, and a great big community with resources for artists, songwriters, musicians, studio and tech, along with music business advice from pros in the industry, all on one site. Make sure you get your free profile now. Go to www.musicstartshere.org. That's musicstartshere.org. You're listening to the business side of music. This is Bob Bender. You're listening to this edition of the Business Side of Music in the studio with us today, Judy Rodman. You know, one of the artists that you worked with uh, was one of the artists I worked with. You had actually written a song, One Way Ticket. Co-wrote with uh, co-wrote it with Keith Hinton. Yes, sure it was did. Cut by Leanne Rhymes, which was right around the time I started working with her. Uh, Leanne seemed to be a natural. You know, she had, I don't know, how, how big of an octave range did she have? Do you remember? No. I mean, most artists, if their voices are, are healthy, really have, a, say, a three and a half octave range. Yeah. And she had every bit of that. But that, uh, but you know, that doesn't mean that's where she sang all her songs. But right. she could definitely have. Yeah, she's under comfort She could do anything she wanted. Yeah, exactly. And she, but the thing that made Leanne different is it really was control since she was a little girl. She had the. Uh, she naturally stood properly, and had her head back, and used her arms right, and somehow and she that's innately. And show when people no. do that. No, oh, it's not. Yeah. No, not at all. Without, if you if you tied my hands down, I couldn't sing. I probably couldn't talk. I'm well, moving my hands as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> but she's the exception to the rule with most artists. I mean, you know what? Sometimes. There are a lot of artists, I think, that are really naturally great singers. Yes. The problem comes when they start getting busy. And then they're a little bit too tired to do what normally they innately know how to do. Right. And then things go wrong. And then what do they do? They push harder because 
you know, there's some monetary incentive for them to to do that, and then things start to go really wrong, and they don't know what to what to do. So what do they do? They push harder, even harder. And so that brings up a question I've been wanting to ask you: vocal rest. That's important. How much time? You know, if if you push real hard and you actually do some damage, oh yeah, is there a downtime that you should just be resting? You know, it, it's kind of like the old neck brace thing. The doctors don't use the neck brace nearly as much as they used to, right? Because they found that it inhibited the healing. Okay, you know, and so doctors are a little uh, less precious about uh, about long voice rests now. But yes, I mean that that should be up. Uh, to that, that should be between a fellowship trained ENT and the patient. What my goal is, is it, I mean, if the voice is hurting, then yeah, back off, back off and try not to talk. And you know, if you've got a really important gig that night, if you're doing the Grammys, you know, are you doing a four hour gig down at the Wild Horse? Don't talk much that day just because you, you need to give it a little rest. And also it does take energy to support the voice. So here, here's something really important to know. When we're tired, our bodies kind of fall. Right. Okay. And the rib cage closes in a little bit and that gives the diaphragm too much slack and it can push too much air. And that's what goes wrong. People don't realize it. So those little tiny muscles in your neck start having to bear the brunt of the controlling the airflow. And they're not built for that. So what I tell my students is, uh, uh, is if you're tired, either don't sing. If you've got to sing, do everything that you don't want to do. Support, support, support. Use your big muscles in your legs and your belly and, you know, go to sleep and, and, and go eat something afterwards. But use, use your energy. And if you don't have that energy to support your vocal cords, don't, don't talk, don't sing. Do things such as like a tea with honey or throat coat, do those work? Ah, give you my other, another little secret. Yeah. The very best throat soother that I've ever found in my 50 years and my students all swear by it unless they're allergic to it (laughs) which are not many but I have had a couple and that's pineapple juice a little pineapple juice like a quarter pineapple juice and three parts water Mm -hmm. so it's real dilute so it doesn't add uh, acid reflux but the bromelain enzyme in the pineapple soothes the tissues of the pharynx and that's better than any spray or lozenge i've ever or tea i've ever found who would have known yeah so um word to the wise out there you know uh on the road bring little six packs of dole's pineapple juice to mix with your water make sure it's in your dressing room right or whatever right right. yeah when you talk about an artist and this is something i is near and dear to my heart especially with songwriters songwriters nights i i really truly think that's the the backbone of this industry is yeah. the songwriters who write mm-hmm. the hits they need to take as much care in protecting their voice as the artist who's got a four octave range and is Absolutely. out there belting it out every night does it make sense for them to find someone such as yourself i mean it will help their craft won't it absolutely first of all first of all you can write better melodies when you can sing them and people find that out all the time. So that's that's one. Two, you can actually teach your demo singer, if you don't want to do it, you can teach your demo singer the melody if you can sing it. Right. And three, you can demonstrate it live in a singer-songwriter songwriter, uh, you know, round if you can sing it. And so, heck yeah. Because a lot of songwriters don't have necessarily great voices, but they're great songs. Chris Christopherson is a great example. How about Chris Stapleton? <laughs> Chris Stapleton, well. Now, he's a great singer, but he never thought about himself as being an artist. What he did was he grew his craft writing. He grew his song, song uh, his singing craft. And he does, he does this thing I call pulling. Uh, that's what I, I call uh, power path and performance. I put it together in this method I, I call pulling for power instead of pushing for power. Right. And it pulls you open even as you sing. So, uh, but yes, singer, singer, songwriters. And another, I just worked with uh, Casey Musgraves, it is uh, a student of mine, and I just worked with her band. She, she asked me to help her band because they were having trouble on the road. So, oh my gosh, the show is incredible. The, the vocals are absolutely incredible. Very lush. I've, I've worked with uh, a fiddle player named John Maylander who 
got his dream gig with Bruce Hornsby. With Bruce Hornsby. And Bruce Hornsby asked him if he could sing a high D. And he said, I don't know, I've never done it. <laughs> so he came into me, and he really wasn't a background singer, but he's got an ear like crazy. And it didn't take us long at all because his ear was so good. Yeah. And when I taught him a little technique, he's hitting high Ds like he's done it all his life. You brought up something that uh, triggers a question in my head, vocal pitch perfect pitch. Mm -hmm. Is that something that can be remedied? I, I, and I hear a lot of singers who may just be a little bit flat or a little bit sharp and, instead of being spot on, but it's enough, especially for me. And it's I hear important. It, when they're singing the national anthem, like at, at a NASCAR race or a baseball game or whatever, and they start off in one key and they end in a different key, is is that something? They're just not call listening it the to the star mangled banner. The star mangled. The star mangled, mangled banner. banner. Is um, that something they're just they're not listening to themselves? Or? There's there's lots of uh, reasons for that that can be, and my job as a vocal coach is to ferret out exactly what's causing it. But here are some of the things that people can check. Uh, first of all, technique. If you don't have great technique, you can know where the bullseye is all day long, but you can't hit it. Can't hit it, right. Uh, so the technique is one thing. Two, you, they may not be listening to the right thing. In the studio, if the bass is up, the overtones of the bass are not quite true up there, so that can throw you pitchy. One thing I've really learned to do is ask that the bass be turned down if I'm having trouble with pitch in the studio. Sorry, bass players. Sorry, we love you, but yeah. <laughs> and, and and then uh, it'll come out in the mix. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is, if you if you are quote unquote tone deaf, it's usually because you just need to do some target practice. And so I've got this three step thing uh, where I teach people to listen, educate the ear, really listen with their ear, and mime it silently. So they're imagining themselves aiming that dart at the pitch. And then that educates the ear, that, that kind of puts the ear and the vocal cord together. And then they start throwing it out there and then I'll tell them if it's flat or sharp and then they can start telling themselves. Adjusting. And they can absolutely learn to sing in tune. Ah, oh, that's so important, it really is. Mm -hmm. How can people find you? I am at www.judyrodman.com and they can find me, you know, from there on Twitter and Facebook and all that, Judy Rodman Voice on Facebook. But uh, that my hub is judyrodman.com. Mm -hmm. Best way to reach you, good. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. All right, Thank you for all you do, Bob. Oh, thank you. As a listener, you know that the Business Side of Music podcast is free. But in order to keep it running, consider becoming a patron of our show. You can do this by going to our Patreon page on our website, which is www.businesssideofmusic.com, and click on Support the Podcast button. When you become a patron of our podcast, you'll have access to material that you won't be hearing on our regular shows, insight from industry leaders that is designed for our patron members, and have the ability to purchase the Business Side of Music merchandise that you can find on our website at a discount. The Business Side of Music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. Co-producer for the show is Vinny Rebus. The Business Side of Music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Los Angeles, California and Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Fusine.